2018 was a year. A year is a thing that 2018 was. And I know there were plenty of us out there who'd rather just pretend that it didn't happen, but the God's honest truth is that there were plenty of exceptional gaming experiences for us to appreciate and enjoy. And one of the toughest parts of this year was for me to make this list. Before we even get started, I'm going to go ahead and point out that every game in my top five made it to number one at some point or another as I was working my way through it. With the variety and beauty that I saw in games this year, it was genuinely difficult to compare a lot of these. It went beyond apples and oranges. After a while, it felt like comparing apples and hand grenades. Seemingly very different objects, but both do a great job of keeping the doctor away. So, let's get into it. These are my top 10 best games of 2018. Octopath Traveler doesn't offer much that we haven't seen before. It's the pretty well-worn territory of JRPG and a big world with branching storylines. But I had such a good time playing it. The music, the well-fleshed-out characters, even the unconventional classes of those characters just charmed the hell out of me. I didn't even mind the inevitable grindy moments because the world you're traveling is varied and really beautiful in a 1994 kind of way. And that sort of brings me to the heart of what I loved about this game in the first place. It made me feel blissfully nostalgic for 8 and 16-bit RPGs of my childhood. Uh, but don't get me wrong, nostalgia isn't really enough to break a top 10, at least not for me. What put Octopath Traveler on this list was how much the developers clearly loved what they were making. It might use some of the same tropes as classic role-playing games, yes, but it's done with an eye for detail that separates the generic rip-offs from the labors of love. This is exactly the sort of Nintendo exclusive that I was looking for. I was never a Smash guy, I don't champ at the bit for news of the next Mario Kart, but an original, classic-style JRPG? Yeah, I'm gonna get excited for that every time. And that's two JRPGs in a row now. What the fuck is going on with me? I've got no problem with them in theory, but like anime, my interest in JRPGs sort of petered out after I reached a certain age. But, also like anime, when I see quality, I can't ignore it. And Valkyria Chronicles 4 is that. With its neo-World War II setting and top-notch strategy stylings, VC4 impressed the hell out of me. Like Octopath Traveler, it stirred some old-school feelings. I compared it to Shining Force in my review for Game Skinny, but Shining Force was never this enormous and bombastic. The character designs, the weapons, the tanks, oh god, I had fun with those tanks. Even the long, drawn-out cutscenes, which I normally hate, found a way to charm and even emotionally engage me. I'm almost embarrassed to have this on my list because it's become so clear the more I research the game itself that this franchise has been a hit for a ton of people over the years, one that I've completely missed out on until this year. But better late than never, I suppose. Now, when it comes to franchises that I have not missed out on, Far Cry immediately comes to mind. Some people have said that if you've played one Far Cry, you've sort of played them all. On the other hand, they do a pretty bang-up job of creating some of the most consistently fun, open-world gaming you'll ever see, and 5 is no exception to that rule. The combat is flexible in a way that is nearly impossible for other games to achieve. If you want to go in guns blazing, there are plenty of satisfying ways to go about that. And if you want to sneak and assassinate, it is incredibly satisfying to do so. The small town Montana landscape is beautiful and fully flammable, with easter eggs and collectibles spread all over the place. The story is bizarre and drug-fueled, like an Expendables movie written by William S. Burroughs. 
and that sweeping nihilistic storyline was equal parts glorious and sort of worrying for me if I'm being honest. The first Far Cry set in the US, 5 gives us a glimpse of the true colors of where they might be attempting to head with this franchise, that of Grand Theft Auto. And just like Rockstar's magnum opus, Far Cry's satire is shaky at best, like sometimes you feel that the writers are just high-fiving it over how clever they think they're being, and sometimes they are being clever, while other times you can't honestly parse out what they're getting at. But at its worst, Far Cry is still over-the-top, exciting fun with unique, well-acted villains and a whole bunch of surprises. Ridiculous vehicles, endless weapons caches, and religious zealots with guns? It feels like home to me. It's the sort of game you can plug in and tear through time and time again, and there was no way it wasn't going to make this list. I love City Builders, and Frostpunk is easily the best one that came out this year. You're playing the leader of a group of survivors of an ice-driven apocalypse, and with the help of what appears to be a fucking jet engine, you've got to lead your tribe through the trials and tribulations of a frozen world while slowly developing the appropriate technologies and laws to keep everyone safe and alive. The best part about Frostpunk to me was its brilliant way of showing you that, in many situations, there are no easy answers. I got a real banished vibe from this game, based on its difficulty alone, but you're also faced with weird moral quandaries that aren't common for strategy games, at least not on this level. My first playthrough, for example, I led my people out of poverty and straight into a fascist police state. Oops. Another time we ended up as part of something that resembled nothing less than a religious cult. And those are necessary steps that you're going to take in Frostpunk, as weird as that is to say. Because while other city builders and strategy games along these lines simply ask you to help your people survive, Frostpunk says that isn't enough. They don't just need to live, they need a reason to live, which... <laughs> okay... You're not just measuring out how many meals a person gets, you're measuring how much hope they have for the future and for their children's future. It's heavy. There's a lot to process there, and the things you'll discover as you do might surprise and frustrate you. And that's what makes Frostpunk the most difficult, frustrating, and satisfying city builder of 2018. I've said this before, and I'm going to repeat it until I'm a corpse. The developers at Rusty Lake are insane, and I love them. Both Rusty Lake Paradise and Cube Escape Paradox represent the latest offerings from an indie studio that I am always excited to hear from. I have read theories and postulations on what the bizarre tapestry that Rusty Lake has been weaving for years now is supposed to represent. And I honestly feel like I'm getting further away from it. Because I'm starting to feel that it's far less important what Rusty Lake's saying, as much as I enjoy how they're saying it. In both Paradox and Paradise, you find yourself collecting items and working out bizarre puzzles in an effort to proceed. Proceed towards what? I don't know. In Paradise, you're faced with the plagues of Egypt, which brings along all kinds of fun locust frogs and blood. While in Paradox, you're sort of working your way through the same rooms in different and odd ways, even taking in live-action film segments centered around the mysterious plot that threads its way through all of these games. They're just too clever and strange to ignore. I cannot help myself when it comes to this studio. They're trying to creep you out, but if you're like me, it's the sort of creepiness that you simply can't look away from. Full disclosure, 
I never played any of the original God of War games, and I've been told from a number of sources that that doesn't matter so much in the grand scheme of things, as this new iteration of the beloved Spectacle Fighter is such a drastic shift from its previous entries. And that definitely seemed to work out in God of War's favor as far as I'm concerned. As over the top and insane as they seemed, the originals never piqued my interest much, but a thoughtful, gorgeous, action-filled game like this one? I was more than a little intrigued. God of War is massive, and I don't just mean that in terms of the world it's set in. Everything about the story, the battles, the characters, and the set pieces just feels enormous. Everything about it synergizes together to create a scale that puts weight behind every decision Kratos makes, every swing of his axe, every lousy story he tells his son. And that's important, too. The relationship with Kratos and Atreus is just the sort of father-son storyline that always hits me right in the guts, and the writers mostly did a great job with it. Oh, and on a side note, the actor who plays Atreus? You cannot overemphasize just how good he is. Even good child actors can be obnoxious or unconvincing, but Sonny Suljic just killed it. If this was the sort of award show where I gave one to best voice actor, I'd, I'd give it to him. No question. As a writer myself, I couldn't help but appreciate how the simple act of Kratos and his son journeying to bury a loved one turned into this enormous epic. And I mean epic, not like cool or awesome or however people are friggin' using it these days, but as in God of War almost has the structure of an epic poem, which for a story set in Nordic mythology is pretty appropriate. And it's all based in a beautiful world that goes from winter tundra to kaleidoscope witch's garden without missing a beat. The dialogue, the characters, the twists, more than anything else, God of War represents a brilliant personal story for the player to engage in. And in an industry that insists that the great single-player experience is dead, God of War and its success gives me a lot of hope for the future. If you caught my review of Return of the Oberdin, you know that I was a really big cheerleader for it. And now, a month later, nothing has changed. I'm not the sort of gamer who requires every experience he has in a video game to have made some sort of innovation to the genre. In fact, gaming as a medium has only improved more and more as time goes on by stealing ideas and putting them to play in different ways. To be fair, that creates as much cash cow crap as anything else, but still, truly unique ideas are harder and harder to come by. So when something comes along that truly doesn't remind me of anything else I've ever played, I tend to pay attention. In 2018, Return of the Oberdin is that game. It takes lateral thinking, narrative, and puzzle-solving mechanics in a direction I've never seen. And while many games on this list tell a more interesting story than Oberdin, none of them tell their stories in such an innovative style. It's not even close. In the process of investigating a ghost ship and recording the fates of its missing crew, you're told the details of a haunting and engaging story out of order and in a way that simply wouldn't work if it was told in any other way. There are plenty of games that could be adapted to film or a book or some other medium, a lot of them have. And you might not lose anything in the process, but Return of the Oberdim is a prime example of a story that shouldn't be told in any way beyond gaming. And it is true that this level of unique storytelling prowess comes with some of the most difficult, hair-tearing puzzles I've ever played. It does get really obtuse, and anyone who just couldn't get past it without a playthrough or a hint guide or a nudge guide, there's a nudge guide on Steam that I highly recommend. You have my sympathy. I don't judge you at all for that. But if you're a fan of games on the whole and how they're made and executed, you must give this game a look. 
because beyond just enjoying Return of the Oberdin, I respect the hell out of it and its creator, Lucas Pope. In 2018, if you were looking for indie strategy that was polished, challenging, and addictive as hell, you didn't need to go anywhere beyond Into the Breach. After making FTL, I suppose Subset Games wasn't content to just have one game in their portfolio that essentially amounted to digital crack. They needed another. Like its predecessor, Into the Breach follows that lose and get better mentality that's pretty popular in the roguelike genre. You play a team of time-hopping mech warriors defending the last vestiges of humanity from a robot insect race bent on your destruction. It's admittedly a story you've heard before. If you fail in your mission, you jump to a parallel timeline where humanity hasn't been destroyed yet, and you give it another go, which is... It's actually one of the most clever ways I've ever seen death explained in a roguelike like this one. As you fight and die and fight and die and fight and die and so forth, you recruit new pilots, update and renew your mechs, and hopefully don't think too much about what happens when you win. I mean, there are multiple timelines out there, right? So when we finally succeed, do we just leave those others to their fate, or... Oh, never mind. Into the Breach also has a chess-like quality to it, in that each individual unit can only move and attack in a certain way, so it's very satisfying to learn the moves you have at your disposal and trick the opponent to your advantage. I will never get sick of forcing aliens to shoot their own troops. You, you just feel so damn clever. You, you, I, I've spent many moments patting myself on the back for what a brilliant military strategist I was. As far as gaming enjoyment, Into the Breach is the best game on this list for both short-term sessions and longer, more focused days and nights. It's versatile, it's engaging, it's a goddamn party. When I first started playing Red Dead Redemption 2, it was nowhere near the top five. And I don't say that for cool hipster points or to be a troll or anything obnoxious like that. No, no. While Redemption 2 was clearly gorgeous and really genuinely interesting right off the bat, it was so damn slow. I, I thought I was going to lose my mind. Everything from your movement speed, to the drawn-out item collection system, to the horse-riding mechanics, to the hunting, it all just, it grated on my nerves initially. I was flabbergasted at the praise it was getting. I felt like I was crazy. Like I was missing out on something that everyone understood but me. So, why the hell is it number two on my list, you're asking? Well, what I ended up doing was taking a break. Just some time to reassess, you know, play the field, see some other games. And if it was meant to be, we'd find each other again. And on a lazy afternoon, I decided to give it another shot. I didn't want to sit down for a long play session, I just wanted to do a couple of the side missions, wrap it up for the night. And when I approached RDR2 with that attitude, everything changed. I found myself hunting and collecting bounties and playing poker, and before I knew it, it was 2 fucking a.m. Because Red Dead Redemption 2 is a slow game. And when you approach it as a slow game, you realize that that is one of its biggest benefits. See, I don't understand the people who plowed through this in the first week. That seems painful. The people I understand much better are the ones who would rather beat it in 50 hours over the course of, say, two months. Because for all the gunfighting and treachery and insane rockstar-style excitement that happens here, I think a more deliberate and slow-paced approach unwraps some of the best parts of the game. For example, riding your horse from one area to another takes a good long while, and that can feel pretty tedious. But allowing yourself on the way to look for herbs, good hunting spots, and the occasional scrap almost makes you forget what you were on the road for in the first place. And honestly, as I'm saying that out loud, it doesn't sound terribly appealing on its face, but 
That is one of the reasons I put this game so close to the top. It's hard to explain the appeal a lot of the time. It just is what it is. Sort of the same way it's tough to explain the appeal of British Bake Off. But when I want to sit back and relax for a little bit, you bet your ass I'm going to watch a bunch of strangers try to make the best lemon souffle they possibly can. It doesn't matter that I don't know what a creme patisserie is. I don't think it's real. I think it's something that they inserted just to confuse the rest of us. But that's, you know neither here nor there. The story of a group of outlaws trying to escape the Pinkertons and live on their own terms is an old plotline. But with Red Dead 2, Rockstar has done what it does best. Take a mediocre or run-of-the-mill story and fill it so full of fleshed-out characters and bizarre scenarios that you just can't take your eyes off of it. Is it a 10 out of 10? No. It's got bugs and unnecessary crap that's hard to ignore, and I'm not even going to get into what the online mode looks like right now. But it's still a brilliant game, and worthy of being called one of the best of 2018. I almost didn't get to this one. It, it keeps happening year after year. There's always this little backlog of games that I'm thinking, I'll eventually get to it, I'll eventually get to it, and the moment I play it, it ends up so high on the list that I'm embarrassed that I didn't get to it sooner. I just, I, I had so many people telling me how good it was. My reaction was still something along the lines of, meh, it's a superhero game. I'm sure it's fun, I'll get to it eventually. It just didn't feel like a priority in the face of the games that were out there calling for my attention that were very loud about how far they were stretching the boundaries of innovation and all that crap that gets gamer nipples hard. But there is no game in 2018 that I had more straight up, unadulterated fun with than Spider-Man. It felt so good to web swing, to glide, to discover. Spider-Man takes all of the hollowness of some of the biggest open world games and returns the joy of exploration to it. The visuals are absolutely stunning, and it was great to see New York look as good as it does. Because after the themes of power and responsibility, all the best Spider-Man movies and comics have always felt like a love letter to New York. So it was nice to see Manhattan get its due. Though, if you could get me to Brooklyn or Queens or something like that for any future DLC, that would be lovely. Wouldn't say no to that at all. Right off the bat, you feel like a superhero playing Spider-Man. Learning to web-sling was, for me, relatively painless, and the moment I hit air, I was completely hooked. I was grinning like an idiot when I first fell into this game, and that left me completely blindsided when the story really got going. I was not prepared for how much heart this game had. I came for the fun with Spider-Man. Hell, based on the gameplay and visuals and terrific music and voice acting, there's no question it would have made it into my top 10. But then the storyline takes over and you find that there's way more layers to this web shooting onion. Why did I, why did I go with web shooting onion? Jesus Christ. The story, with its themes of poverty, lost love, and mortality, is executed as gracefully as the web swinging itself. There's a level of emotional kung fu that the designers didn't have to include to make this a great game, but they did. And it was that level of heart and personal love for their product that swung Spider-Man right to the top in 2018. Hey, Patty, don't sink a little drinky. Daddy, get sad and blue. Sneak a little drinky, snickety do. Sneak a little drinky past you. Sneak a little drinky, snickety do. Sneak a little drinky past you.